Stay hungry, stay foolish. The key to success in sales and marketing often lies in the art of persuasion. But in a world of distractions, it can be challenging to capture the attention of your audience and tap into their decision-making process. Today's guest is founder of SalesBrain, the world's first neuromarketing agency, built upon two decades of research on the effect of advertising and sales messages on the human brain to create a breakthrough persuasion strategy. Based on the latest research in neuroscience, media psychology, and behavioral economics, today's guest makes understanding the complex science of persuasion simple. We will discuss the award-winning persuasion model Neuromap, a science-based, comprehensive, yet simple step-by-step -step process that helps develop successful marketing and sales messages. This strategy of persuasion is useful in both business and personal success. Today's guest is author of the new book, The Persuasion Code. How neuromarketing can help you persuade anyone, anywhere, anytime. Patrick Renvoisé, welcome to the show. Good morning, Aiden. How did I do on my pronunciation there, man? Not too bad. You describe yourself as a French nerd, Patrick, passionate about the brain and marketing. So you decided to mix these two passions together. That's right. And it took me a while to figure this out. But, you know, I've spent my life uh, selling complicated and expensive things. I was actually with a uh, computer company called Silicon Graphics for many years. And I sold multi-million dollar supercomputer. But I was always puzzled by the fact that nobody ever taught me the science of persuasion. In other words, a lot of people think that persuasion is as much a, an art as they are a science. But I am a scientist at art, so the artistic part is not my forte. So I've been trying to remove all the art out of persuasion. We shared a link before the show that 30% or more of the US GDP is actually based on this art of persuasion now. Yeah, if you think about it, uh, you get persuaded 100 times a day, be it by a billboard that you're seeing when you're driving your car, being by your spouse who is trying to get you to make coffee early in the morning, uh, being by your kids that are trying to get a little bit more pocket money, whatever it is, people are always trying to persuade you to get to uh, what they want. When I read the book, the first thing that came to mind was the Henry Ford quote, if I asked them what they want, they would have said a faster horse. We can't easily articulate what we want. It's kind of funny because this is what marketing is supposed to do. In other words, the definition of marketing in a few words is, I think, quite simple. But it's the idea that you ask people what they want, and then based on their answers, you will build a product. And later, you will build a strategy to sell that product. This is what traditional marketing has been all about. But we have enough scientific proof today to say that this way of looking at things is ineffective at best. Why? Because it forces people to self-describe what they want. But in reality, people don't know what they want. It's a little bit like if you're going to a restaurant and the chef tell you, what do you want to eat tonight? You won't be able to express what you really want. And that's why people have menus in restaurants. The promise of neuromarketing, which first appeared about 15 to 16 years ago, is that we're not going to pay so much attention to what people say when they report what they want. Instead, we should be able to measure various physiological changes that happens on our body. And when you bypass the self-reporting, of people, you'll get a better, a more accurate measurement of what people really want. Let's talk about that a little bit, because the problem of a lot of focus groups and surveys is that it's declared data or self-reported data. And you tell us that polls and, and self-declared data and surveys don't accurately tell us what people want. And this is what you've done with SalesBrain and your own neuromarketing business, is that you look at the behavioral data of people. So you look at their neurophysiological changes and you've created a unique process that looks at the changes that happen in people as they experience something. Yes. Well, if you think about how complex the brain really is and how all these physiological and psychological processes are happening in the brain, when you're asking people, what do you want? You're forcing the output to go through a funnel, to go through a bottleneck. And that bottleneck when you ask people to express using words what they want, is a tremendous uh, amplifier, distorter of what people really want. So 
it's a little bit like, again, the brain is this huge volume, you know, contain this huge volume of information. And when you are asking people to use words to describe what they want, forcing them to go through that filter impact their view of what they really want. I was thinking about this, Patrick, because we're in an age where trust is at an all-time low. So people tr don't trust their government, they don't trust media, but also they don't trust the metrics that they're getting from advertisers. And that you have developed this process where people can actually see in real time what actually people are thinking, not, or what are they feeling, what are their emotions telling us. And I thought about the blocker to that, because it's still being held back a little bit. I suppose marketers are a little bit embarrassed because... They didn't know about this and they've been working with old models and now's their chance to actually just go, you know what, we didn't know this existed and it's time to shift towards a totally new model. Well, what's happening is there are really two worlds out there, if you want. There is the world of neuro where you have a number of researchers that understand some of these concepts. And then you have the world of marketing, in other words, the world of business. And these two worlds do not talk these two worlds are completely separate. And what's happening, and you know, I, I want to believe that we were one of the companies that helped create a bridge between those two worlds, is we are starting to help a lot of business people understand what only a few researchers knew. And of course, this is creating a big wave because now all of a sudden, we can come up with a model that explain how persuasion works. In other words, up until recently, all this science of persuasion was so complex that you know, nobody ever came up with a single model that explains human decision. So this has been our contribution, if you want. We wanted to create a simple yet 100% scientific model of what people do with their brain when they make a decision. Let's start looking at under the hood, literally, at what's going on in the brain. You talk about three critical systems, the reptilian complex, the limbic system, and the neocortex. Yes, that's right. Actually, in our first book, we talked about these three layers in the brain. In our new book, we've uh, used the latest research on this, which suggests that the reptilian brain and the middle brain should be considered one single brain. So we talk about the primal brain, which is the reptilian brain and the middle brain, and we talk about the rational brain, which is the neocortex. In fact, um, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in Economy in 2002, also wrote a book on the subject, and his book is called Thinking Fast and Slow. And he talks about two systems in the brain. He named them system one and system two. System one is the primal brain. System two is the neocortex. And Kahneman demonstrated, and in fact, this is how and why he received the Nobel Prize. In other words, he demonstrated, he just didn't say it. He proved it, that system one always win today. In other words, that our primal brain, although we want to think of us as rational people, our primal brain today still has more impact on our decision than our neocortex. You call this the bottom-up effect, and I love this. And when I thought about it, it was almost like, so your primal brain and your rational brain are driving around in a car all the time. And lots of advertisers and lots of marketers try to appeal to the rational brain, thinking that's the more clever brain or the more advanced brain, while it's actually the primal brain who's kind of going, nudges the rational brain and goes, hey, this is worth looking at. This is, this is of interest. And that totally changes the game. Yes, you're right. And, and you've used a very interesting word, which is the word nudge, because there is another author by the name of Richard Thaler who wrote a book called Nudge. And Thaler was a student of Kahneman. And Thaler also won the Nobel Prize in Economy, not in 2002, but in 2017. And uh, Thaler also describes, talks about System 1 and System 2, and he's also convinced that the key to persuasion is about impressing upon System 1 or the primal brain. And you've built on that work, including your earlier work on neuromarketing, you've built on this to bring it right through all the way to sales. Let's talk about attention, because attention is the new battleground, really, because it's a place where many people are struggling with their focus and attention, and also the flood of messages we get every day. You tell us about reflexive attention. I thought that would be really interesting to share that with our audience. Yes, yeah, so the field of attention is a very, very complicated subject that neuroscientists are trying to crack. And I think the best way of explaining it is, is the following. If you take a typical brain, a typical brain processes about 11 million bits of information per second. 
So, you know, you're sitting right now and maybe some people are listening to this radio show and the brain is receiving a tremendous amount of information. They have information that comes from the five senses. So a lot of information comes from the visual sense, then their touch, their smell, etc., and all the internal processes that goes on inside their brain. Unfortunately, they cannot attend to these 11 million bits of information that comes to them, and they can only process 50 bits of information per second. And this is what defines attention. Attention is what helps us put you know, most of our focus on only a limited set of processes or information. So it's a little bit like this, right? Like imagine you're driving in the dark at night and imagine you're, so first of all, you're still driving. So you're getting all the information about the speed of your car and the lights that, uh, you know, you see in front of you, but you're still thinking about a lot of things. In other words, you might be thinking about uh, what you're going to be eating tonight, that you have too much work and, and all of that. So that, that focus, those 50 bits of information that you can focus on are dedicated to help you drive the car and think about what you're thinking. However, if a light flashes on your right-hand side, that flash of light will force your attention to go through that flashing light. It's like a reflex function. It's just like when you eat your knee and it contracts your muscle. That flashing light will force your attention. It will result in you turning your head towards that source of new information. So that's what the field of attention is all about. And as you can imagine, marketeers are trying to get your attention because they want you to take the next click. They want you to spend a little bit more time on the home page. They want you to, at the end of the day, decide to click on the buy button. So people are competing to get that little bit of attention. And people are trying to define what attention is, but it is really, really complicated. So what we're trying to do with our model is to make all that field of attention a lot easier so that marketeers can now know what uh, you know, they should be doing. And I'll, I will give you one quick example that talks about attention, but it's the notion of contrast. You know, without contrast, it is very hard to pay attention. You know, if I go back to my example of the person driving in the dark of the night, what makes them turn their head towards this flashing light is the fact that everything was dark outside except that flashing light. And that contrast forced their attention to go there. Now, if you translate that into the world of business, what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, most companies, when they want to promote their services, or their services, they claim that they are one of the leading provider of. And the problem is when you say, I am one of the leading provider of, there is absolutely no contrast. Why? Because all your competitors are saying the same thing. This notion of attention starts with people saying something different, something which has enough contrast between what's been said and what every other message is, is using. I'd love if we focus a little bit more on some of the solutions you offer and the neural map as well, which is just a phenomenal tool. And I'm using it myself. I mean, you, you have a convert here with me. Once I read the book, I was like, this is phenomenal. And you're very generous in that you give the map in the book. You give an appendix at the end of the book where you can run through a questionnaire and go, do I match all these elements in order to get the best bang for my book possible? Before we go there, Patrick, it'd be great to talk about how um, our emotions and how homeostasis, for example, plays a role, because there's much more at play. It's like we have this, I thought about the, the idea of a shepherd and a sheep, and it's like our emotions behave as a shepherd and herd us into certain behaviors the whole time, and we're totally unaware of. And by being aware of them, it can empower us in a way. Yes. So to make this uh, rather clear, let's think about the very first form of life. And one of the most basic form of life is a unicellular. So if you take a unicellular, that unicellular typically still has to make a couple of decisions. And the, the most important decision that those unicellulars are making is the following one. When they get stimulated by something, the question they have to ask themselves is, do I want to get closer to that stimulus or do I want to get further away from that stimulus? Let's take an example. If you take a, you know, a typical unicellular and you put a drop of sugar close to it, sugar is a source of energy with this which this unicellular needs. And so what will it do? Well, if it senses sugar close to it, that unicellular will get closer to the stimulus. Now take that same unicellular and put a drop of acid close to it. That unicellular, instead of going closer to the acid, 
will move further away from the acid. And our emotions and our behavior as human beings has evolved from that simple principle, which is when we see, hear, or feel a stimulus, we ask ourselves, do I want to get closer to it or do I want to get further from it? And we make that decision based on our chances of survival. So down at the cellular level, we human beings are still meant to react to those stimulus in the same way. And to do that, all our cells have to keep what's called homeostasis, which is we need to keep a constant state of equilibrium at the level of our our cells. In other words, if the environment becomes too acid, to keep the same level of acidity, we will move further away from it. So even today, this is something which a lot of people don't realize, but all the decisions that we make are based on this principle of, do I want to get closer to it? No, like, for example, I'm looking at an ad from Apple that uh, I want a new phone. Then, of course, this ad is going to create a level of desire that wants me to make to get closer to it. So, all the work of advertisers today is to create that impulse that pushes us to go towards our product as opposed to go, to move away from it. But we found that behavior is actually the result of how we have evolved as a living mechanism. That's what's happening on the inside, Patrick. You gave us some examples where we can show that the primal brain is in charge, is the one in the driving seat most most of the time nudging the more rational brain. And you give us the brilliant example in the book of the candy equation. It would be great to give that dilemma to our audience. Yes, Hayden, this is a a really good one. So let's uh, do this. Imagine you're going to buy a cookie and a candy. And you know that the cookie and the candy is... $1.10. $1.10. That's the sum of those two items. And then people tell you, well, we know that the cookie is $1 more than the candy. So the question is, how much is a cookie and how much is a candy? So again, a cookie plus a candy equal $1.10. We know that the cookie is $1 more than the candy. The question is, how much is the cookie and how much is the candy? I'll let you think about it. I know the answer, so I, I won't spoil it for people, but I, I have given this test to everybody and everybody says it has the same answer. Right. Everybody answers, well, the cookie's going to be a dollar. And that's the fast brain, the primal brain, jumping to the conclusion, which happens to be wrong. Because if you do this, then the difference would be only 90 cents. So the real answer is the cookie's $1 and 5 cents and the candy is 5 cents. However... Regardless of your level in mathematics, in other words, you can have a PhD in mathematics, most likely your primal brain, your fast brain, may you jump to the wrong conclusion. And what I love about this, Patrick, is even when you tell our audience now, and even when they probably write it down or contemplate it, your primal brain still fights it. And then you'll ask yourself again, and you're going to go, how is that again? You'll kind of forget because it's like the primal brain is constantly fighting to go, actually, I'm right here. You use this as a brilliant example to show some of the biases that are a result of our primal brain. And one of the brilliant ones is the gain maximization bet and the loss of avoidance bet. Yes, the loss aversion bias is probably one of the most important biases. And by the way, most people don't know this, but we human beings have 188 cognitive biases. And those cognitive biases all find their source in the fact that we decide with our brain, which is not the rational brain. But you're talking about the loss aversion bias, and that's a very, very interesting one. So let's see if we could do this over the radio. So, Aiden, I'm going to ask you to do a bet. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do two different bets, and I'm going to give you two options for each bet. So in the first bet, you have the option of making $5,000 for sure. So you have 100% probability to make $5,000. Or... Your option is we will flip a dice or a a coin, and if the coin lands on heads, you will win $10,000. If it lands on tail, you will win nothing. So again, you have two options. Either you can win $5,000 for sure, or we will flip a coin, and in one case, you will make $10,000. If it lands on the other side, you will make nothing. What would you choose? I would go straight for the money and go, it's guaranteed 5,000. I'd go for that. Yes. In fact, you know, Kahneman, who did that test, found that about 97% of the population 
we choose that option. All right. So, so far, so good. Now, let's do another test now, another bet. In this other bet, your first option is to lose $5,000 for sure. Or we can flip a coin and you can lose $10,000 or you can lose nothing. So what would you choose? Again, you have two options. You can lose five grand for sure, or you can lose 10 grand, or you can lose zero. And what will decide is the toss of a coin. So in this, Patrick, I'd go for the flipping the coin because it seems like the only rational choice that I have. Right. And that's also what Kahneman found, that 97% of the population would choose that. But if you think about it, it does not make sense. In other words, if you, we're going to see these two options written it doesn't make sense. In the first option, you choose the, to win the $5,000 for sure. In the option when you will lose something instead of gaining something, you are taking more risk by you know, having an option to lose twice as much. Now, researchers have given a name to this, and they call it the loss aversion bias. In other words, when we own something, we don't want to lose it. The negative emotion of losing it is not the equivalent of the positive emotion of making the same money. And in fact, some researchers have even been able to quantify it. And the quantification of that loss aversion bias is very, very interesting because it explains a lot of things. But let me tell you what the magic number is. The researchers that have quantified that loss aversion bias came back with the number of 2.3. And let me tell you what that 2.3 means. Now, imagine I'm going to sell you, let's say, a pen. And imagine this pen is worth $2.3. If we didn't have the loss aversion bias, logic would say that if I sell you an object, a pen, which is worth $2.3, then you would be willing to pay $2.3 for it because this is a fair trade. On one hand, you receive the equivalent of 2.3. On the other hand, you pay $2.3 for it. But because of the loss aversion bias, the negative emotion that you will feel by having to pay $2.3 suggests that you would want to receive an amount of value which is 2.3 times that amount. So in reality, when you buy to something which is worth $2.3, you are only willing to pay $1 for it because we are non-symmetrical when it comes to experiencing emotion. We have that loss aversion bias. And if you think about it, that explains a lot in sales and marketing. In other words, that explains why it is hard to sell. Why is it hard to sell? Because whatever it is you're selling at a price of $1, people are not expecting to receive $1 in return. They're expecting to receive $2.3 in return. So said in late term, that means everybody wants to drive a Porsche, but you know, people only want to pay the, the price of a regular Toyota for it. I found this one really interesting in in respect to this show, because we talked on the show about trying to sell an idea to your boss or trying to sell innovation within an organization, or if you're a change maker or a maverick within an organization, it can be very, very difficult to sell a brand new concept that could be a new business model. And I thought this, the way you describe it so brilliantly and so simply, which is a very difficult thing to do with such a complex theme, is when you're trying to sell a new innovation theory or a new business model, the people, even though they know the old business model is broken, won't let go of it. And you have to do so much more, much work. And I, I'm sure you see it in your work because in your work, it makes total sense when you read it. But you're trying to get people to let go of the old mental models and accept the new. And therein lies the huge problem. Yeah, the, the threshold of change, as you say, is, is very, very high. And in fact, some researchers have proven that for us to change, our brain experiences the equivalent of torture. You know, if you think about it, um, I assume that you like coffee in the morning, do you? Yes, man. I, as you know, I lived in Toulouse like you did. So I got addicted. Right. So, you know, every morning when you wake up, you're in the habit of drinking that cup of coffee. So your neurons, as you are drinking and sipping on that cup of coffee, they fire in the same pattern. And if your doctor, for whichever reason, told you, well, you know, Aiden, now you cannot drink coffee anymore. It's bad for you. You're going to have to switch to green tea without sugar that change of the experience of drinking green tea over coffee now re requires your brain to fire those neurons in a different pattern. And forcing that change of pattern is extremely, extremely painful. In other words, you know, our primal brain, our brain that decides what we want, 
is the brain of habits. And once we have a certain habit, to break it is very, very difficult. And once again, you have to prove to people that they will gain so much more to force them to go through that painful experience. Patrick, you, you say there's 188 biases that we suffer from. I thought it'd be really interesting to share a couple more before we start looking at how we can unwrap them and fight against them. And the other one that you talked about that's really interesting when it comes to pricing and it comes to marketing is anchoring bias. Yes, so the anchoring bias is a well-known one by people who've been involved in negotiation for a long time. And it is that once you set people's brain into a, an area of value, uh, they will have a really hard time to move away from that. That's why they call it the anchoring effect. And the idea is, you know, when you're in a negotiation situation, the first one who suggests a price is going to lose because the price is only going to go higher if you're the seller and it's going to go lower if you're the buyer. In other words, once people have set their mind into one direction or one amount of value, it is very hard for them to go beyond that. So the idea is... Uh, if, for example, I am selling you something, I want to create the perception that that something is extremely expensive. Because if you buy a Louis Vuitton bag at $500, you're going to be making a good deal. Why? Because you have anchored your brain towards the idea that a Louis Vuitton bag should be in the two to $3,000 price point. However, if I sell you any other brand which is not in my mind as luxurious as the one you know I just mentioned, Louis Vuitton, and I tell you, well, you know, maybe you should buy my bag. It's only $300. $300 might seem to be an incredibly high amount of money if that brand is associated with a much lower price point in the first place. So this is the anchoring effect. And of course, anybody who is trying to sell need to set your mind towards the fact that their product is val is so much more valuable than what people think. And you unlock this. I mean, you don't you don't just give us all the problems and all the, the biases. You set this up first and you go, look, this is what you're dealing with. And then you start unlocking how we can actually act in this world with the primal brain. And you talk about six stimuli needed for any persuasive message. It'd be great to share those six. Yes. So as we said, human beings are afflicted by 188 cognitive biases. And those biases are by nature rather complicated. In fact, that list keeps evolving because we, we keep discovering new ones almost every year. Uh, some of them are very old. Uh, we've known them for you know over 60 years, but some of them were discovered just a few years ago. And they all find their source in the fact that we are primal people and that we are driven by this system one, our primal brain. So what we've tried to do instead of you know, forcing an explanation on 188 cognitive biases, which is very complicated, we have summarized these 188 cognitive biases in what is called six primal stimuli. In other words, you can understand, you can help people understand human behavior by looking at what will truly make an impact on the primal brain of people, and what will really have an impact on those brains need to have a stimulus component, which can be summarized to six of them. So let me review them one by one quickly. The first one is uh, self-centered or personal. In other words, by definition, we are selfish people. And most people don't realize how selfish we really are. Why? Because at the end of the day, every decision that we make is based on our own survival. So that's the first stimulus. It is personal. The second stimulus is contrastable. And we spoke already a little bit about contrast. And it's the notion that if you want people to react, you need to show them an image or an experience which will have contrast because it forces their attention. The third stimulus is tangible. In other words, the primal brain does not understand complex concepts. In fact, the primal brain barely understands words. Why? Because if you think about it, words have only been around for about 10,000 years for written words, and they've been around only for about 50,000 years for spoken words. However, our primal brain, or system one, is approximately 500 million years old. So words are not tangible enough. Words have not been around for long enough to make an impact on our decisions. 
And if you think about it, because words are not tangible enough. And so again, I can give you a, a very simple example of that. But imagine we are locked into a room and you see smoke coming out of one of the doors. And if I tell you, don't panic, because if we panic, you know, we may just trip over each other and somebody will die. But if you see that people are rushing towards the door, the fact that I'm using words, tangible words, that, that are trying to prevent you from doing the wrong thing, it will have zero effect on you because down the road, words are not tangible enough. In other words, if your brain sees a lot of people rushing towards the door, the fact that you use words to counter interact with this uh, concept, it's not going to do anything. Patrick, is that why, for example, if somebody's panicking, it takes a while for them to create the capacity to listen to you, to hear your message, or even children, for example, because their more advanced brain isn't as advanced as, as an adult, for example. Yes, absolutely. Because we do not process information in a linear way. We do not process every stimulus in the same fashion. Our brain has various neural paths that uh, will either favor or discount different kinds of stimulus. So, for example, the stimulus of word is much less important than the stimulus of visual. In fact, visual is one of the next six stimulus, which is our brain favors the visual stimulus. And there are many reasons for that. But one of them is the optic nerve is much faster than the auditory nerve. In other words, the optic nerves carries approximately 50 times more information than the nerve from the ear to the brain. So when I'm talking to you, if I'm trying to use words, which of course will be decoded by your auditory cortex, that message will arrive to your brain in a much slower way than if I show you a visual. So that explains why uh, the visual stimulus is important. In fact, in the US, it is illegal to show visual bodies of soldiers that have died in a fight. Why? Because they know that it creates such an emotional cocktail to people that it is not allowed. So you're, you can report on the deaths of American soldiers. You can use words to do that, but you're not allowed to show images. Within visual as well, there's four types of visual stimulation, which is really useful for marketers. The 3D moving object, the static object, the 2D moving object, and the static image. It'd be great to share them. Yes. Yeah, so, so now, even when you're talking about the visual stimulus, there is a hierarchy of stimulus that have a greater impact on your brain. And in fact, if you go back to our origins, it's a very interesting test. Um, I have actually another test, which is kind of interesting. And it's when you ask people, think, give me an object, give me the name of a tool. And if you ask people, give me the name of a color. And if I can disconnect your neocortex and your primal brain at that moment, and usually the way to disconnect that is to ask people prior to asking those two questions of think of a tool, think of a color, and give me what this tool and this color are. If I can force your neocortex to do something like a little bit of math, for example, when then you're faced with the question, think of a tool and think of a color, I will access more directly your primal brain, then guess what happened? Well, something really interesting happened, which is most people give you the same tool and the same color. Although, you know, people could choose from a very large set of possible tools, very large set of possible colors. If once again, I can access directly your primal brain response, I would get either a red or a blue hammer. I do this test in front of large crowds, and this test works beautifully. In other words, if you're in front of 200 people and you do this test, you have over 50% of the people that give you either a red or a blue hammer. Why? Because the object, the 3D object of a hammer is one of the most important objects for survival. Why? Because if you're equipped with a hammer, you can defend yourself and you can, you know, eat various kinds of food like nuts. You can break the shells of the nuts. And the red or blue are also the first color that comes to our mind because blue is the color of water, which is needed for life. And red is the color of danger because it's the color of blood. Right? So this is, this is a great example where 
the visual stimulus of asking, you know, forcing people to think of an object, they will think about a hammer, and people can see in their mind that picture of a hammer in 3D. Right? So even within the visual stimulus, you have a hierarchy of stimulus that have a greater impact on the brain. I thought this was so fascinating because while while the book you talk about marketing, you talk about sales, it also helps presenting and presentations. And I thought it was fascinating that you said under the visual stimulus that we see letters, so bullet points, for example, on a presentation, we see them actually as hieroglyphs. We don't see them as words, as individual letters. Our brain actually sees them as, as shapes or pictures. In fact, the last chapter in our book, the one which is titled Deliver to the Primal Brain, is all about presentation skills. Because at the end of the day, when you're in marketing, you have to answer two critical questions. The first question you need to answer is, what do I need to communicate? In other words, what is the content of my message? And then once you have solved that equation, you still have to ask yourself, how am I going to communicate that concept? And unfortunately, the how you communicate concept typically is more important than the what you need to communicate. So the how has to do with, for example, visual. The how has to do when you have two different presenters, you know, think about it. If you launch a new product and you have a team of 100 salespeople, unfortunately, those 100 salespeople, even if you have agreed as to the what people should say to maximize your probability to sell that product, those 100 salespeople are not going to get the same results. Why? Because each and every one of them is going to have a different charisma or a different way of presenting. Right? So the how they're going to communicate the message is still going to generate radically different results in how they were able to persuade others. Well, that persuasion linked to their charisma or their chi or the way they say things, we've, we've come up with a very fine model. And it's all described in our, the chapter four of our book, which is actually the longest chapter in the book. And it's all about the how do you go beyond words to communicate? So how do you create the proper visual that will have the best impact on people? How do you create an experience that go simply about talking? In other words, how do you trigger emotion in the brain of people? Because emotion is one of the six stimuli. You have a sense of these. You get told, make sure that you make your main points at the start, that you cre- you introduce a problem, and then you introduce the resolution to that problem. And then... So you start with what I'm going to tell you, then you tell you, and then you tell you why you told you. But you break this all down and and let us understand what's going on inside the brain. And you talk in the memorable section about the U-shaped curve of memory. Yes, so that's actually linked to two cognitive biases. These biases, we've known them for at least 60 years now, and it's called the recency and the primacy effect. So here is what happens, right? If we were a logical thinking machine, And imagine if I was going to pitch you on something, right? So imagine, Aiden, I'm trying to sell you a product, whatever the product is, and I'm going to give you 10 rational arguments about why you should buy my product. So I'm going to give you, imagine I'm going to give you only 10 words of why you should buy my solution. Logic would say that if we were rational thinking machines, we should be able to remember these 10 points in a linear fashion. In other words, that the probability that you you would remember the first word or the last word, or the middle word would be the same. But unfortunately, we discovered 60 years ago that it is not true. We have what's called the recency and primacy bias, which is when something is completely new, in other words, the first time I said a word on my list of 10 words, because it was the first time that I pronounced the word, people will tend to remember that word more. And the recency, so that's the primacy effect, the first one. And the recency effect is, the last word that I said, you know, was the most recent in time from now, is the word that people will remember the most. And unfortunately, most people will forget most of the words in the middle. So we've known about that recency primacy effect for a long time. And this, these two cognitive biases, or this stimulus of memorable, what makes an event memorable, has huge impact on everything marketeers should be doing. Because the human brain does not remember things linearly. As you say, it follows a U-shaped curve, which is we remember things at the beginning, we remember things at the end, and we forget everything in between. I absolutely love it. I love the way you explain why people tell you these things, which is often what you don't get. And when you and what you do so brilliantly in the book is give us 
the science behind the process, which which really is is a great way to get the naysayers and often the CFOs who don't want to invest in your product over the line as well. The last of the six you talk about is emotions. And it'd be great to, to delve into that, Patrick, because this I found absolutely fascinating, the pain of gain or the pain of regret, for example. Yes. So, you know, we've known for a long time that emotions played a big role in the process of decision. But if you really study what neuroscientists are saying, they go even further than this. In fact, one of the greatest experts on the role of emotion in the brain is a professor. His name is Antonio Damasio. And he wrote a, an absolutely amazing book back in 1995. And his book, amazingly enough, is titled Descartes' Error. And let me tell you what he says in the book. He says, we are not thinking machines that feel. We are feeling machines that think once in a while. We are feeling machines that think once in a while. So it's not like emotions are optional. We know now for sure that emotion is the basic fuel that is needed by the brain to make a decision. Why? Because there is no such thing as a rational decision. It just does not exist. Why? Because the brain is an emotional processing machine. And Damasio demonstrated this brilliantly. And he wrote a fascinating book on the subject. And his book is titled Descartes' Error because, as you know, Descartes was a French philosopher who lived in uh, the 1500s. And Descartes uh, thought that there was, because we were rational people, that there would be a way to process information linearly. In fact, he wrote an essay called Le Discours de la Méthode, where he described what we're supposed to do if we want to land on the best, most rational decision every time. And we were under the illusion that we human beings were rational up until Damasio, again, it's quite recent, in 1995, demonstrated that it does not work that way. In fact, he said, you know, Descartes was brilliant, but he was completely wrong. And he demonstrated that we are emotional creatures that make emotional decisions. So here is what happened, is we make emotional decisions unconsciously, and then we will take several cycles to justify rationally why we made that decision. But down below, all our decisions are driven by this need for emotion. And again, remember that these emotions find the, the roots in the notion that if I get a stimulus, I'm going to ask myself, is it a positive stimulus? Do I want to get closer to it? Or is it a negative stimulus? And do I want to move further away from it? In fact, the word emotion comes from the Latin words movere, which means to move. So an emotion is what precedes motion. In fact, we talk about emotion, right? So an emotion is what is needed for us to decide if we want to get closer or further away from a stimulus. And of course, all the marketeers are trying to create that positive emotion that will draw you towards the product. And the field of emotion is fascinating. We could talk about it for hours or days. But to my knowledge, there are at least 22 different models of emotion. Uh, but you have to understand that a lot of people are using the word emotion in the wrong way. In other words, they mean by emotion the fact that people are not rational. In fact, when we tell people, don't be emotional, we, in fact, we want to tell them, try to use more your neocortex, try to use rational more than what you just did in that decision. But you cannot ask people to not be emotional because that's what we are. But the beauty of it, though, is that emotions are rational. And scientists modelize emotion. As I said, there are at least 22 different scientific models of emotion whereby scientists draw how emotions uh, you know, impact our behavior. Now, Barrett and Russell are two American scientists, and in their model, they have a very simple model where they look at emotion along two axes. One axis is the axis of positive or negative emotion. And the other axis is the emotion that puts you to sleep and or emotion that gets you wired. In other words, emotion that gets you excited or emotion that gets you, you know, asleep. And on that continuum, if you think about we human beings go through, we go through a roller coaster of positive and negative emotion at the rate of about one every three seconds. So if you look at the wake time of a regular human being, we go through about 48,000 different kinds of emotions a day. 
In fact, uh, another scientist by the name of Kluchik has a model of emotion which is really rich because he's talking about eight primal emotion or eight basic universal emotion that everybody experiences. And he says that when you combine some of these emotions, you get another emotion. So for example, he has the emotion of joy and he has the emotion of trust. And when you combine joy and trust, he calls that love. Right? So, so in his model of emotion, you can have different intensity of emotion. So joy, if you take a lower level of that emotion, you will, you will get, I um, can't remember how he, he calls it, but joy at a lower level has another name as an emotion. And in his model, you can combine all these emotions. Now, unfortunately, in English, we have only eight to 9,000 words that describes emotion. Yet we human beings are capable of experiencing, you know, depends who you ask, by the way, but if you ask Buddhist people who have studied emotion for many years, they, are, they say that, Human beings experience up to 64,000 different kinds of emotion. If you ask other scientists, they will give you a, a number of about 12,000. The problem is we only have eight to 9,000 words that describe emotions. So that means there are still many emotions for which we have no name. But here is the key, though, is we human beings are going through that roller coaster of positive and negative emotion at the rate of one every three seconds. And we will experience those to about 48,000 times a day. Now think about what's the secret of why we buy. So in this mess, which you know maybe we will call our lives, which is that roller coaster of positive and negative emotion, why would people decide to buy something? Well, people will decide to buy something only to the degree that they believe that the product or the service that they will buy will take them from a negative emotion. In other words, they are experiencing some kind of pain. We, we, we use the word pain in our book because pain describes really well what a negative emotion is. Right? But people will go from a negative emotion, which we call pain, to a positive emotion, and that's the value of the product. Right? So imagine I, I lost my, or I, I need a new car. Well, I'm thinking, that, so that's my pain today, right? My pain is, my car makes a strange noise. I'm afraid that it will break any time now and I will be stranded in the middle of the highway. That's the negative emotion that I have. I really need a new car. I'm afraid my car is going to die any minute. So now I'm thinking, wow, I need to buy a new car. And if I buy a Porsche, I will look really good in that red sports car. So what would make me want to buy the car? the Porsche is that positive emotion that, oh yes, I will look nice in that red sports car. So that's the promise, the secret of why we buy. The secret of why we buy is because we are made to believe that the product that we will buy will take us from a painful situation, a negative emotion, right? I need a new car. My car is going to break to a positive one. Oh, I'm going to look great in that red sports car. Now in the case of that red sports car, I know, however, that I will have to pay for it. And paying for the product creates a negative emotion, right? So the secret of why we buy is that marketeers want to make us believe that at the end of the day, the positive emotion that we will experience when we will buy the product will be greater than the negative emotion that we are experiencing linked with the fact that we have to pay for it. And to make things even worse, we know that that negative emotion fundamentally needs to be multiplied by 2.3 because it's the loss aversion bias, right? So again, the, the sacred grail of persuasion when it comes to selling something is to make the audience believe that the positive emotion that they will experience is greater than 2.3 times the negative emotion that they will experience by having to pay for the product. And that's how emotions play in every decisions we make. When you think of the competition and homogenization of brands, this knowledge for people is absolutely gold. We've talked about a lot of the problems and built up the pain for so many of us, you know, overcoming the primal brain, overcoming all the cognitive biases. You give solutions and the neuromap is fantastic, very easy to use, but it'd be great to finish up with delivering to the primal brain. You mentioned this chapter earlier on, chapter eight, very long and detailed chapter, and you include six persuasion elements and seven persuasion catalysts. It'd be great to finish with them briefly, Patrick. Yes. Yeah, so uh, let me give you a couple of ideas. So on these persuasion elements, think about how people traditionally 
try to influence people. In other words, you know, I, I've been in the computer business for a big period of my life, and I have seen thousands and thousands of corporate overviews. And in the corporate overview, people talk about who we are, what we do, our people, our technology, etc. And that has very little chance to influence people because it's all self-centered on me. And by definition, my prospect, primal brain, is personal, so they only care about themselves. And because the attention span of people is very short, the idea is how can you communicate your value proposition? In other words, how can you get the brain of your audience to quickly, and when I say quickly, I only talk about you know, a few seconds, understand how if they buy your product, they will experience that positive emotion. So you know, using words to try to create an emotion is very, very difficult. So we have this notion in the book of how can you grab the attention of your audience by communicating to them in less than seven seconds some kinds of experience that will help them leave the experience of that positive emotion. And I will give you a very simple example that, that people typically understand because it's very, it's very easy. But imagine if you're selling a product to regrow air for men. Right. So a lot of men are bald and their pain is they don't look good without hair. So how could you communicate the value proposition of a chemical that regrows hair? Well, the thing that, and how can you do it in less than seven seconds? So imagine if I was going to try to do this, I could tell you, well, Aiden, you know, I think you're, you're starting to lose some of your hair here. Maybe you should consider a product that we grow hair. And we have this new chemical, and I'm going to start talking to you about the, the chemical element in the product that I'm selling. Zero impact, right? So how could I create what we call a grabber? In other words, an event that will help you relieve in seven seconds or less the positive emotion linked with my value. Well, here's what I would do. First, I would start by showing you a picture of a bald guy. Why? Because by showing you the picture of the bald guy, you will immediately relieve that negative emotion of the pain. And then guess I'm going to contrast this image with what? Then I'm going to contrast you that negative emotion with a picture of the same guy now, but with a head full of hair. And do you see how by seeing now that guy with the hair, with his head full of hair, immediately you will experience the emotion that, oh yeah, if I use that product, I will go from the pain to the relief of the pain. And now all of a sudden, I'm capable of communicating my value proposition in less than seven seconds. And, and in fact, we've seen that in many other examples. But the other very ex famous example is if I sell you a product to lose weight, right? So I can start talking about how often you're going to have to come to the gym or I'm going to start, I could start talking about a long list of things you should eat and things you shouldn't eat. But if I do this, I will not be able to help you relieve that positive emotion in, in less than seven seconds. So how will I do it? Well, I would show you a picture of the guy who weighs 300 pounds, and then I would show you a picture of the same guy who now weighs only 150 pounds. And by doing this, your primal brain will go, oh, yes, this is me. Now I'm overweight. And if only I was going to you know, buy this product, boom, instantly I would lose you know, half of my weight. Again, when you understand why, it's not somebody's opinion, it's actually fact. Right, right. And, and the key, it's, again, what can people create in terms of stimulus to communicate their value prop in seven seconds? We call that a grabber. And the technique that I have used, uh, that I was describing to you, is called a big picture. In other words, how can I show my value proposition in one visual? And in the case of the guy who has no hair, my visual would be contrasted because on the left side, you will see the guy with no hair. And on the right side, you see the same guy with a lot of hair. So all of a sudden now, I have created an event which in just a matter of a few seconds, help your brain relieve both the negative emotion of the guy with no hair and the positive emotion of having a head full of hair. That's one of the six message elements that we describe. And let me tell you one of the seven message boosters or message catalysts, as we call them, and that one is called wording with you. Now, if, I mean, we understand that uh, you, you know, most people still need to use words to describe their value proposition. But one very simple way to make that message much more personal 
personal is to use the word you. Think about uh, how very often people focus their message on, well, this is who we are and this is what we do, instead of saying you. Now, let me give you an example. Imagine if I was going to sell you a drill or drill bits. I can tell you my drill rotates at 10,000 RPM, and because my drill rotates at 10,000 RPM, uh, you, know, you, you will be able to drill as many holes per day. No. Instead of saying my drill rotates at 10,000 RPM, you should say you will be able to drill 10,000 holes a day. So the idea is put the emphasis not so much on the product, but put the emphasis on the person who's going to be the product, which is you. So by translating all the messages which are written typically in the we or the our language, translate those messages into the you language that forces the brain of your audience to put themselves in the driver's seat. And all of a sudden, you, Aiden, who has no hair, will be able to regrow hair and you will have a head full of hair. So one of the message callous is to force yourself to look at all the message that you're broadcasting, be it on your website, on your PowerPoint, and see how often you use the word you versus using the word we. And we tell people, if your ratio is greater than 50%, you're in trouble. In other words, a good ratio should be 80% of the word you're using should be written in the you language, and only 20% should be in the we language. No, your message should be focused on the prospect, Therefore, it should be written in the you language, you the prospect, you the potential buyer of my solution, not me the seller of my own solution. One simple way, again, to increase the impact or to make your message catalyzed around that, you know, the persuasion model is to make sure that they are written in the you language. It's such a brilliant book, Patrick, and we only scratched the surface of it today. We didn't even get it to the Neuromap. There's so many more of the cognitive biases that you explain, and it's really written in an accessible way, which is very challenging. And of course, one of your skills, where could people find out more about your work, find out more about neuromarketing? Yes, well, people can learn more about us on salesbrain.com. And our book, The Persuasion Code, is available on amazon.com and you know many other websites. Uh, again, the book is titled The Persuasion Code because, uh, you know, in the early days of our companies, we were focusing the message on neural marketing, but it seems like people understand the issue of persuasion better than neural marketing. So we renamed the word, the, the book, The Persuasion Code. To my knowledge, this is the only book that presents a unified model of persuasion. You know, it's the only book that explains how to use the 188 cognitive biases to your advantage. Author of The Persuasion Code, How Neuromarketing Can Help You Persuade Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime, Patrick Ranvoisé. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Eden.